All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and Happy New Year. This is January's First Friday Safety in Circles with Kristen Timmons. So we do have a poll today. I'm launching that right now. If you guys um, could answer that, that would be awesome it's just to help us get some more information on um, the actual number of people that are watching. So I'll give it maybe a minute or so. So while you guys are voting, um, we do have questions. We'll save them till the end. So if you have a question during the webinar, feel free to type it, and we will um, read them at the end, and Kristen will answer them. If you have any questions for me, you can send me an email during or after the presentation at ariana at frontlineco.com. Our handouts are at the bottom. They're also on the website along with the quiz, so those are available to you right now. Um, I would appreciate if you guys can finish the quiz at least by midweek next week, and then you'll be receiving your PDHs the following week after that. Um, so I'll close this. Thanks, everyone, for voting. Um, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Kristen. Okay. Thank you, Ariana. Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to Safety in Circles. My name is Kristen Timmons. I'm the project manager with Crawford, Murphy, and Tilly consulting engineers in Springfield, Illinois. Today I'm going to be talking with you about the um, City of Springfield's Archer Elevator Road and Isles Avenue Roundabout Project. Just to give everyone a little background on the location of the project and history, for those not familiar with Springfield area, um, the project's located on the very west side of, of the City of Springfield. You can see on this map I-72 along the south and east side of Springfield and I-55 running along, running north-south along the east side of Springfield. The picture on the inset is um, an aerial photo of the intersection of Isles Avenue and Archer Elevator Road. Some background, project development information. This project, um, was started back in 2007, but really stemmed from increased westward expansion of the city of Springfield. Initially starting over 25 years ago, but uh, mainly within the last 15, 10, 15 years, the city has seen a lot of residential subdivisions coming into the area, and those are typically then followed by recreational and commercial growth. The two photos that I've included here um, are actually two larger developments at the intersection. The YMCA facility um, has been, it's been within the last 10 years that this has been uh, constructed and in place, and it also includes a sports rehab facility, and they're planning future expansion, soccer fields, et cetera. And it's located in the southwest corner of the intersection. And then the picture on the bottom is Concordia Village, which is a retirement community and this is located in the northeast corner of the intersection and it's probably at least doubled in size in the last 10 years and i believe they also have additional development plans along with the development though comes the need for uh, improved streets and infrastructure and unfortunately in this area the existing street network was well, the urban street network was non-existent. There's only um, north, south, east, west oil and chip roads that have been present since the area was primarily used for agriculture, and some of the area still is used, has agricultural use. So all of these developments have come in, and there's been um, a slow, slow buildup of infrastructure to to coincide with that, unfortunately. And so you see the traffic increasing, but they're using these old oil and chip narrow roadways and it's 
you know, it's a hazardous situation in some cases. On the bottom of this slide, you can see the um, average daily traffic increases for both Archer Elevator Road and Isles Avenue based on the IDOT traffic count. So as I mentioned, the developer, development was moving a little faster than the city planners could basically um, keep up with, and, and more importantly, then there, then there was available funding to build the infrastructure to go along with the development. The city did initiate preliminary engineering in 2007. Um, that process did take a while. However, we were able to get uh, design approval and design engineering began in 2015. Um, one thing I wanted to point out was functional classification of both roadways, for minor arterial roadways. This next slide is, um, I think, an interesting graphic that shows two different aerial images, one from 2005 on the left and 2016 on the right. And I've pointed out our trail elevator road. I've also labeled I-72 at the bottom of the image and Veterans Parkway, which is a major north-south um, arterial for the city of Springfield. And you can see the development spreading west and the difference between 2005, 2016. And there's a roadway here, the north-south roadway called Cokie Mill Road that's directly west of Veterans Parkway. The city had previously undergone you know, similar types of study and improvements to this road as it experienced you know, commercial, uh, recreational, commercial, residential growth. And so the city was, you know, knew what was coming for our trail elevator road. It was just a matter of, of getting the funding to, to build the road. Early on in the design, it was determined that two construction sections would be necessary, and part of that's due to funding and, you know, will provide primarily due to funding availability. So the city prioritized the intersection of Archer Elevator Road and Isles Avenue, along with improvements along Isles and Archer, um, as that was the, the major, you know, major traffic was located around the intersection and um, you know there's some safety issues at the intersection as it was. So the first construction contract currently under construction includes over 2,500 feet along Isles Avenue and over 3,000 feet along Archer Elevator Road in addition to the intersection improvements. The second construction section will be north and south sections of Archer Elevator Road planned for 2018 pending available funding. And that includes over 1,300 feet north of the current construction section and over 3,000, 3,500 feet in the south section. On this next slide, you can see the breakup between the two contracts. And, and on here, I'll point out um, contract one, which is shaded in the, the light uh, green. Isles Avenue is um, running east-west. West and Archer Elevator Road is running north and south. And the YMCA development is in this southwest corner, and the Concordia Village development is in the northeast corner. In addition, I'll, I'll point out uh, the Springfield Park District property. It's called Road Repark, and it includes multiple um, ball diamonds, football field, et cetera. So, in surrounding all of this, you can see all the residential subdivisions. And then I also want to point out we still have some agricultural uses to the south, which you know we anticipate will be developed within the next several years. Contract two, which is currently under design, um, extends to the south to the improvements that were completed along with the Wabash Avenue project in 2016-2017. So once completed, the entire project. Um, our trail elevator road will be improved from Wabash Avenue um, all the way to Greenbrier Drive, which is at the right-hand side of this image, which is a City of Springfield minor arterial road, minor arterial roadway. Some project features. I'll just quickly um, show you the typical section here. Archer Elevator Road, as I mentioned, was an existing oil and ship two-lane roadway with the uh, Fairly limited right-of-way, um, so it was determined that a 
three lane section with a two way left turn lane, four foot bike lanes in each direction and a sidewalk would be built along Isles Avenue. The project includes a five lane urban section, two lanes in each direction with the center turn lane, bike lanes and sidewalks in each direction. And there was additional available right away along Isles Avenue which has allowed for this to be a, a wider section and matches it to the existing Isles Avenue to the east. Now, obviously, the, one of the main reasons people are tuning in today is to hear about the roundabout intersection at this location. So we'll get into that in some more detail. A few other project features. Bicycle and pedestrian accommodations, as I mentioned, bike lanes along both aisles and Archer. And this is an this kind of um, goes along with the city, the Springfield Simon County Regional Planning Commission's aerial bicycle network, and the, the the plans for connectivity throughout the area. Sidewalk connections are provided to existing subdivisions. Sidewalks at Rotary Park, YMCA, et cetera. So I'll get into talking a little bit more in detail about the intersection here. On this screen, I've got a shot on the left of the existing intersection. As you're approaching from the west, looking east along Isles Avenue, and you can see it's a four-way stop one lane in each direction. And what you can't really see here are the drop-offs, but there are some significant drop-offs in, I believe, three of the four corners in this intersection. And on the right is an image of the newly completed roundabout at the intersection of Archer Elevator and Isles. And again, you're looking east, same direction, and you can see the Concordia Village in both both pictures. I believe this photo was taken within a couple of days of the opening of the intersection. So a lot of people have asked why roundabout and in particular why roundabout this location. Some of the important features that both the city and CMT considered when evaluating roundabout um, in particular, the safety. And the FHWA has indicated that well-designed roundabouts can reduce in rates of injury crashes by 75%, according to Institute, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. But in particular, the potential for hazardous crashes is definitely reduced. I mean, that's very evident with the number of vehicular conflict points in a conventional intersection versus a roundabout. You're talking about 32 versus eight. In addition to that, one of the other safety features would be reduced speeds through the intersection. And why is why are speeds reduced? Well, there's a number of reasons. Splitter islands have been added, narrow, narrow, narrowing the entry width, a center island, and just requiring all traffic to yield upon entry into the roundabout. On this graphic, um, which is taken from the Federal Highway Administration Roundabout Guide, really illustrates the conflict points that I mentioned. You can see on the left all of the multiple opportunities for conflicts at a traditional intersection with four legs and one lane in each direction. And then on the right, you can see a, a standard single lane roundabout and we're talking again about 32 points at a traditional intersection versus eight conflict points at a roundabout. The city of Springfield does have some experience with roundabouts. This is not their first. The, the actual first roundabout in the city is located at 12th Street and Capitol Avenue. However, one thing to note about this is a much more residential, um, lower traffic area. Um, so there is, is, it's a smaller footprint, less traveled. Um, it has been in place for several years now. So the people in that area, I'm sure, are very familiar with it. 
but it is uh, one thing else to note is located near a school. So there are some people who are skeptical about, you know, pedestrian safety at roundabouts, but so far the city's had good experience with this one. We also reached out to IDOT to get their perspective most recently about our roundabouts and the safety and policy initiatives engineer has stated that IDOT is open to the construction of roundabouts at any reasonable location, and especially at locations where analysis shows safety benefits would result. And one thing I wanted to include here that I learned from IDOT is that there are 63 roundabouts open within the state as of March 2017, which I was a little surprised to find out. Um, some people have said and thought that IDOT's, you know, not pro roundabout and that the state of Illinois is um, behind the times on implementation of round roundabouts. But uh, I, I mean, I think 63 is a, is a higher number than what, what I originally thought there was, but you can see that the majority of them are on the local highway system. And I think part of that is probably just due to the, you know, the local agencies have a little more flexibility in, in, uh, in evaluating what type of, you know, intersection improvements may be needed. And, you know, typically those are, you know, not uh, major thoroughfares, whereas, you know, state, state highway intersections may have a little too much traffic or may not be ideal locations. Also, the city of Springfield reached out to the city of Peoria recently and talked with their city engineer. Being a close, closer metropolitan area and having some similar similarities in, you know, having an urban center and then suburban areas, we were interested to see what they had to say. And they've had very few crashes, as, no, as noted here. They have five roundabouts currently in place in a variety of locations. Uh, I believe there's two within the urban like core of the city and two in a suburban areas of the city and one in a more rural location. Uh, one I want to point out here that was constructed in the last couple of years is at Allen Road and Tickley Grove Road. And this is a more of a suburban slash rural location adjacent to an elementary school and they did install pedestrian rapid flash beacons there for an added safety measure because we do have they do have some higher um, higher speed traffic approaching the roundabout. Here's an aerial view of that location and you can see the uh, school in the bottom um, corner of the intersection. A couple other um, municipalities and local agencies that we've talked with the city of O'Fallon. Some of you may be familiar with this area down by St. Louis, Southeast St. Louis. They have multiple locations throughout the city that have been converted to roundabouts. Prior to construction, the public was skeptical and, and I think it's now kind of commonplace. Um, I spoke with someone the other day that said they weren't familiar with that area and they went down there for a soccer tournament and noted how many roundabouts there are and they weren't used to roundabouts so but I think the people that live there are. In McHenry County they now have three roundabouts. One of the recent openings is at Charles Road and Raffle Road and it's a rural roundabout with some higher higher approaching speeds that had existing safety issues, many crashes. And it was originally posed by some on the county board. However, I think they're seeing the light and now in favor of roundabouts and other locations. This is a view of that intersection in McHenry County. It's a nighttime photo showing the lighting and lighting is very important at roundabouts and in particular in a rural area where you may not have other lighting from commercial or residential developments. So as I mentioned earlier, this is not Springfield's first roundabout, it's actually the second, but why is this a good location? Well, in evaluating and we looked at what's, what kind of traffic is 
going to be out there, not just how much traffic, but what kind of traffic. This is a suburban area, quite a bit of driver familiarity. It's not a heavy um, tourist part of the town. You have a lot of residential subdivisions located very near the intersection, people traveling to and from the park to their homes and the YMCA and back. The other thing is the ADT wasn't significantly, wasn't a significant factor in that it wasn't as high as some of the more commercial heavy traffic intersections that's in the city. There's also few, very few signalized intersections in the vicinity of this location, and so we wouldn't have any concern with, you know, traffic backing up from uh, a nearby signal. There's also available right away, which is sometimes an issue if you have a tight urban intersection. The roundabout footprint is generally always larger than the existing signalized footprint, and so additional right away is typically needed. This area also had a record of 26 crashes in or around the intersection from 2008 to 2011. Bicyclists and pedestrians are typically always accommodated at a roundabout. And one of the important features that we think um, this is a good fit in this location is there is some there is increased pedestrian traffic in the area. And in a roundabout, pedestrians actually only cross one direction of traffic at a time for each approach. There's a splitter island located on every leg in which pedestrians can have refuge and versus a traditional intersection which may or may not have a median and you may be crossing three to four to five lanes of traffic and in, in traffic coming from both directions there's reduced vehicle pedestrian conflict points 24 to standard four leg introduction intersection to eight at a single lane roundabout Traffic volumes and flow. As I mentioned, the traffic volumes in this area were not as, as high as some of the you know, heavy commercial areas of the city. And the capacity of a single lane roundabout is roughly 25,000 combined ADT. In this area, we're, we are looking at a combined ADT for Archer Elevator Road and Isles Avenue of, a roughly, of roughly 11,000 ADT in 2016. And the projected ADT in this area is 16,600 by 2036. So you can see we're still significantly lower than the, you know, max numbers. And typically slower traffic speeds in a signalized intersection. You have a curved exit, map to ma exit path to maintain low vehicle speeds. And as I mentioned earlier, there are several, several, um, several different impediments to slow you as you are approaching the roundabout, the narrower entry widths, the splitter islands, the central island. However, once you're in the roundabout, you know, the actual radius of the roundabout is controlling the speed as well as the curved exit path. There is a yield as you approach the roundabout. However, we feel that, you know, it's shown that there's actually reduced yield time versus sitting at a red light and sitting through an entire cycle. In a roundabout, you're just simply waiting for a gap in the traffic. And for a design vehicle, in this location, these are minor arterial roadways, and the design vehicle was a semi-trailer truck. And at most roundabout, roundabouts, the design vehicle is accommodated through the use of a truck apron. If it was designed, if the actual inner circle or driving circle was designed for a trailer truck, it would be considerably larger and you would have a lot wider pavement and you'd see a lot higher speeds. So to control that, truck aprons are used to accommodate the turning movements of the semi-trailer trucks, but still keep the vehicles within a narrower circular roadway. In selecting a roundabout, the City of Springfield and CMT were particularly concerned with public 
public um, just education and information and public outreach. During the phase one, a public meeting was held. The education and safety aspects of roundabouts were provided to public as well as the simulation video. And you can see the hand handout there on the right. Um, in addition to the public meeting, the city has had ongoing communication during design and construction, Facebook, press releases, multiple planning commission meetings, emails, letters. And in addition, prior to construction, the public works went and met with the folks at Concordia Village to explain a little more in detail about the use of the roundabout and the construction and answer their questions and address their concerns. I'm just going to go ahead and hit play here. This is the simulation video that was shown to the public at the phase one. Oop, sorry about that. Let me try that again. I think having the simulation in this type of situation was pretty important to helping the public understand how the roundabout would operate and visualize. Okay, some of the design features of this particular roundabout, you can see the plan view inset there on the aerial imagery. It's a single lane roundabout, as I mentioned. The footprint for a, for a roundabout, a single lane roundabout, the minimum inscribed circle is 100 foot, and that's to accommodate a WV50 design vehicle with the use of a truck apron. In this location, we have a 130 foot inscribed circle diameter, and our design vehicle is a WV65. We were able to accommodate that in all, in all turning movements in all directions, except for the northbound right turn movement. And I'll point that out to you there. We have a residential property in that corner, and it was important to the city to minimize impacts to that property. And if we had um, widened out this radius to accommodate the WB65, we would have further impacted and taken property away from well, taking the yard space away from this property. So one one thing we did um, look at was just how many design, well, not design vehicles, but how many semi-trailer trucks are do we see in this area? What kind of traffic is actually out there? And for the most part, there are very few semi-trailer trucks other than those making deliveries to the YMCA or to Concordia Village. More often than not, there are some grain trucks that, that are using the intersection, and those are smaller than the WB65. The lane configuration and bypass is slightly different than a traditional single lane roundabout. As I mentioned earlier, there are five lanes along Isles Avenue and three lanes along Archer Elevator Road. So with a single lane roundabout, the additional lane approaching approaching along Isles Avenue had to be accommodated and actually one would say dropped before entering the, the inner circle of the roundabout. So we handled this in, in slightly different ways on both legs of so the east leg as you're approaching the outer lane becomes a right turn only lane and traffic is still required to yield before turning right to go northbound on Archer Elevator Road. However, traffic does not actually enter into the in driving circle, inner circle, and roundabout. As you're approaching from the west, the traffic again is in the outer lane. Is, the outer lane is transitioned to a right turn lane. Now, this traffic is actually then um, channelized into a, a 
strictly a right turn lane, and we call this a right turn bypass lane. And there's an actual physical island separating this traffic from the roundabout traffic, and it, and it is not required to yield. Now, the reason we were able to do this here is because we do have an additional lane that then transitions to a right turn lane at the YMCA entrance, which is just one block to the south. And there's a significant amount of traffic that um, uses that entrance off of Archer Elevator Road. And so it was determined that um, during the intersection design study phase that a right turn lane was needed at that entrance. One other thing I wanted to quickly mention was the drainage at the roundabout. Um, a standard roundabout design would have all of the drainage from the center island flowing away from the center island and out to the outer uh, curbs in the outer circle of the roundabout. In this particular location, um, the Archer Elevator Road is in a downgrade as you head to the north. And due to the right-of-way constraints that we have, and in particular, the residential property on the east side, it was not feasible to introduce an additional sag curve to allow for the drainage to come away from the intersection in this area. We had to maintain the downgrade um, through the entire intersection. So that did um, you know, complicate things slightly during design and in construction, but they were able to uh, get it worked out. Some design features, again, additional design features, the central island and truck apron. This photo was taken the other day, and you can see we're looking at uh, intersection from the east, looking at Rotary Park and the central island. Typically, there's always landscaping or some kind of visual sight barrier in a, in a central island, and this is recommended to actually help, again, with the traffic and the speeds. Because if you're approaching the intersection and there's no visual barrier, and you look at, you know, look across the roundabout and there's no traffic, people are going to maybe even tend not to yield at all and just go right into the roundabout with really without really um, paying attention to everything. And if there's a visual barrier of some kind, whether it be landscaping or a sculpture or something, um, it, you know, it'll help to make people take a longer look, slow down a little bit more before they go into the roundabout, and hopefully you know, notice any pedestrians, bicyclists, or other vehicles approaching. In this spot here, or in this photo here, you can see we don't have the landscaping in place yet as we were, we opened in December, so we will be coming back in the spring and, and finishing with the landscaping. Signing and pavement marking are very important. The city of Springfield is you know, very interested in, you know, whether or not the signing is going to be, you know, the, the ideal for or fit this location, we we are open to, uh, you know, making some changes if need be. Uh, there's quite a bit of signing out there to help people, you know, be aware and hopefully understand how to move throughout the intersection. Lighting, um, you can see couple of light poles around the perimeter of the roundabout. FHWA strongly recommends all lighting be around the um, perimeter of the roundabout and versus the interior of the roundabout. Um, that way, there's more focus on the, and they would like to focus on the pedestrian crossings and as opposed to the central island and, and you know, we, we want to limit the or discourage pedestrians from crossing over into the central island. As I mentioned, there's shared sidewalks and a shared use path around the perimeter. The shared use path is, is for the is also for the bicyclists who may not want to traverse through the roundabout. There are bicycle exit ramp locations in all four quadrants. Here's a schematic view of the um, Central Island Landscaping Plan, which will be put in place in the spring with some trees and shrubbery in the center, tall prairie plant plantings around that, and then um, grass around the last few feet of the Central Island. The construction phase, um, 
just wanted to speak a little bit about that. This is a photo taken in October. You can see the Flutter Islands and Bypass Island are under construction. The contract was awarded in March to Halverson Construction Company for $5.18 million. And as I mentioned earlier, this did not just include the roundabout, it also included um, several thousand feet of roadway along both Archer Elevator Road and Isles Avenue. The general construction staging was as follows. Stage one would be a partial closure of the north section of Archer Elevator Road and the west leg of Isles. And stage two would be a full closure of the intersection, south leg of Isles and east leg of, or south leg of Archer and east leg of Isles. We did have some slight modifications to this during construction. Um, it was it was decided that it would be beneficial to close the intersection sooner. We were able to do this and still maintain traffic to the entrance of Concordia Village along East Isles and the YMCA along South Archer. Utility coordination, as with any construction project design, you know there's a lot of utility coordinations. And in particular, this corridor, because there was a lot of surrounding development already in place, the utilities had kind of I would say used up a lot of the available right away. <laughs> and since we had a two lane road going to a three lane road and along Archer and a two lane road going to a five lane road along Isles, there would definitely have to be some utility relocations. There was just no way around it. Uh, one of the larger utility impacts that we identified early on was this large transmission distribution line which runs along the east side of Archer Elevator Road. And you can see in this photo the pole running through there. The pole in the foreground is a smaller wood pole, but the pole in the background there is one of the large 24-inch diameter poles, steel poles, which are extremely expensive to relocate. And it was decided that it would be a priority to minimize impacts to that line. So we did have a lot of coordination during design, prior to letting meetings, prior to start of construction, and then ongoing during construction. And even so, I, I wanted to include this picture because, try as you may, we still have issues with conflicts. And you can see the lap in the bottom of this photo. That's actually the center of the proposed shared use path, which is going around the perimeter of the roundabout, and the pole closest to us in the picture, the wood pole was actually put in just prior to, well, actually just a few weeks before this photo was taken. During construction, this pole was put in place, and unfortunately, it's right in the middle of where the shared use path needs to go. And because it's an eight-foot path, and you have to have a certain offset from the face of curb, it does not fit between that face of curb and that pole, even though it looks like it may. And because we have a ditch on the back side of the pole, there's not enough room to fit the pole, the path on the back side of the pole. So this is a situation where the utility unfortunately had to come back and move the pole. Here is a video taken in October some drone footage of construction, just kind of showing you an overview of the site. You can see in this photo, in this part here, where the YMCA entrance is, is uh, open still to traffic. And they're doing paving along the west leg of Isles. And then you can see Rotary Park here. There was only one entrance to Rotary Park there at the very west end, and so that had to be maintained during throughout construction. There's Concordia Village. It's a fairly large development. And you can see the entrance there on East Isles was uh, required to stay open during construction.
Um, schedule. The project was awarded in March, as I mentioned, and construction did not actually get underway until early May. We had some issues with utilities and weather. Unfortunately, that did kind of set things back. The original um, opening or the original completion date for the project was November 30th, 2017. But fortunately, we did have some good weather here at the end of the season, and we the contractor was able to keep working into December, and the road was actually open to the public. The intersection was opened on December 11th. Thus far, um, the city has received all positive feedback, and they'll be continuing to monitor the intersection for any accidents, issues, concerns. I've included the same photo here on the bottom um, of the intersection as you're looking you're on the west leg looking east along aisles and you can see some of the signing pavement marking uh, etc and there's quite a few vehicles in this photo in the roundabout itself at the same time over here on the right i'll go ahead and play this this is some video from the actual opening fairly soon after it opened i think within an hour or so of opening you can see some different vehicle types moving through the intersection. And you can also see here the speed of the vehicles traveling through the intersection. Now, initially, um, I think we'll see slower speeds as people get used to it. We might see a little bit higher speeds, but um, the fact that they still have to yield upon entry is, is uh, I think going to keep speeds down, and once there's landscaping in the Central Island, that'll help as well. Got a couple more photos here, and then we can do some questions. Um, this is just an image on the left of the uh, Slaughter Islands under construction. And then on the right is a photo taken just a couple days ago, um, looking at the shared use path, pedestrian crosswalk along Isles Avenue and kind of looking north along um, Archer Elevator Road at the same time. You can see that's a wider crosswalk to accommodate both bicycles and pedestrians. And you can see the Splitter Island there with a the refuge. Um, the uh, detectable warnings are covered up with snow in this photo, but they are there. <laughs> and you can see a lot of signage to alert the traffic about pedestrians, the yields, the um, the roadway signage, um, et cetera. So I'm going to go back here to um, the photo, the before and after photo, and then I'm going to see if anyone has any questions. Kind of a good photo, I think, to show you a little bit of the change that was made there. So. I'll go ahead and turn this back over to uh, Ariana, and she can take questions. And thank you for your time. I'm not sure if Ariana's on right now. We'll we'll see if she comes back in a moment.
Kristen, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll start with the questions if you're, I don't know if you want to share your screen again. I don't know if there sure. are, people may ask for pictures. Yeah. Um, so here's the first question. Will the stop sign to the east of the roundabout remain? Will the city add more lighting to the approaches? I do not believe the city has completed all the lighting yet. That was, we were primarily concerned with making sure the roundabout was lit prior to opening. That was very important as IDOT requires the round, roundabout to be lit. So is my understanding that there will be additional uh, lighting on both approaches if it is it's not already in place. Probably be this spring though before they get to that. The stop sign on the to the east at Archer Elevator, well, at Isles Avenue and Meadowbrook Road, I believe is what the question is referring to. It is my understanding that the city intends to leave that that stop in place. It was previously not a four-way stop, um, but during construction, it was determined that a four-way stop would be a much safer condition, and I believe the city intends to to leave the four-way stop in place. Okay, um, next question. Can you point out the location of the truck apron? Um, well, in this photo that I think everyone can see right now, you can see the, the uh, red colored stained pavement to the interior of the vehicles, traffic that is the inner, that is the uh, the driving circle or the driving lane is where the vehicles are, and then that red stained pavement is concrete pavement. That's the truck apron there. And there's a mountable curb between the asphalt driving lane and the truck apron area. Okay, and how does the cost of construction for a roundabout compare to a traditional intersection that would handle similar volumes of traffic? Um, that's a good question. I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but we did look at that um, during the phase one, which has been a couple years now. Um, but the cost, if I remember, was not significantly more for the roundabout. I believe it was under 100,000, but please don't quote me on that. Again, I don't have that number directly in front of me, but we did look at that and it was a consideration. But there's also the long-term maintenance, you know, of a signalized intersection that would have been needed at this location that we won't be seeing. There will be no signals, you know, to maintain or upgrade in the future. Okay. Um, I've heard many gripes from West Side acquaintances regarding the total time the intersection was blocked for construction. Was there any impediments to the construction schedule or was this a reasonable total time for such a project? Um, well, we believe it was a reasonable total time. We did have some impediments early on to dealing with utilities and weather. Um, the original schedule did not have the intersection closed as early as it ended up being closed. However, um, the contractor requested that the intersection be closed earlier to allow them to start working in that area sooner. And because we were able to maintain access to both Concordia Village and the YMCA via their existing entrances, you know, it, it was more of a, I guess, it, we understand it was an inconvenience. Um, but this did allow the contractor to start working at the intersection earlier and um, you know we may or may not know if he would have been able to come finish this year if that had not happened okay uh, what is the cost difference for the actual roundabout relative to a conventional intersection um i believe i addressed that earlier as far as we did review both the cost of the traditional signalized intersection and a roundabout at this location and i don't think i mentioned that but signals were warranted at this location so um it was not just a uh, it would not have been a four-way stop in the 
proposed condition. That was the existing condition, but signals were warranted. So um, again, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it was slightly more for the roundabout. And part what of that, was that due, I'm sorry, sorry, part of that was due to the footprint too. The footprint of the roundabout is requires more right of way than a traditional intersection. What were the major staging progressions for this project? Um, well, there were initially planned to just be two stages, um, which would have been the north leg of Archer Elevator Road and the west leg of Isles Avenue. And that was how the project started out. So the intersection did remain open for the to the south and east for the first couple months construction was underway. And then the intersection was closed um, in its entirety. Um, I believe it was in early June of this year. And then um, the contractor continued with work into the intersection, but maintained access at the south end and the east end to Concordia Village and YMCA. So we did have some slight changes there to the staging. Um, but for the most part, it was just anticipated it to be two two staging operations. Okay, it looks like this is the last question. Why is there only one single right turn bypass lane on Isles Avenue? Um, that's a good question. Um, we don't really have a significant number of right turn traffic in the in the, at the intersection that would warrant. Uh, right turn lanes in all directions. So that was not ever initially, I guess, part of the part of the design. It was, however, necessary in this location because Isles has five lanes of traffic and Archer only has three. And so, instead of um, narrowing you know reducing the lanes prior to the intersection entirely it was decided that the outer lane for Isles Avenue would be converted to a right turn lane for both directions now the reason there's a bypass lane in the one area is is due to the fact that we were able to provide that additional through well it's a, actually a right turn lane along the south leg of Archer Elevator Road which was required for the YMCA entrance, which is near the intersection. And so you can only provide the bypass lane when you have that additional lane to, to for the vehicles to go to. Um, and on the other leg, Archer doesn't have an extra lane, so, the, so it's not a bypass lane there, it's just a right turn lane and they do have to yield to traffic in the roundabout. All right, so if anyone has any other questions, um, Kristen, is there a good email they can reach you at? Yes, it's um, first initial K and last name Timmons, T-I-M-M-O-N-S, at C-M-T-E-N-G-R dot com. All right, well, thanks so much again, Kristen, and thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, registration for February is open, so we'll hope to see you next month.